Hello, this is Pastor Matthew Woods from Grace Lutheran Church in New Albany, Indiana, <clears throat> and this is the weekly devotion for September 19, 2022. Today's title, Hope is More Than a Four-Letter Word. Most of the time when I hear the word hope, it is often used as a word that expresses more of a, a wish than a certainty or a conviction. I've said it myself, boy, I hope that I get there on time, something like that, and how often I uh, I've heard the phrase, you know, I hope so, I hope so, uh, in response to something that we're just not certain about, that we hope something will change, such as an illness. Or we may hear it <clears throat> when we have our doubts, I hope so. Uh, I have a, I hope my new dishwasher lasts longer than the old one. Um, you know, we say stuff like that. In regard to, uh, in this regard, I've, I've, I've uh, heard longtime Christians even say, I hope that that I will get to heaven someday, um, with a question mark. Uh, it's left upon the way they say it. You know, I hope that I'll get to heaven someday. It's more of a wish, or there's uncertainty to that. Hope is one of those words, though. I think that has lost touch with what is intended for it, especially from a scriptural point of view. So this morning, this day, I would encourage you to turn to Romans chapter five, verses one through five, and that's where we're going to go today. It says, <clears throat> since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through which our Lord Jesus Christ, or through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we, uh, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us uh, because God's love has been poured out upon us uh, through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So far that reading. <clears throat> but as I read it, I hope you noticed that in the writer, uh, from the writer of Romans, is this confidence, um, <clears throat> whom I believe, of course, is Paul. Well, Paul's not wishing he had peace uh, uh, with God, or is he? He's not doubting if Jesus loves him, or has died for him, or will even take him to heaven. Paul, who often calls himself the worst of sinners because of the former persecution that he laid upon the church, uh, he had all kinds of reasons to doubt his own salvation, but did not. He could have wondered if his sins were just too big for Jesus to die or to forgive, uh, to die for on the cross and forgive. A friend of mine who struggled with alcoholism often wondered if he would ever be forgiven by Jesus because he believed that his deeds were unforgivable and he had a hard time forgiving himself. He, like many, are often tortured with such doubts. But let's notice the words that Paul uses here. We have. We have peace, present tense, with God, meaning our sins are forgiven in Jesus, justified through faith. And we have we have access by faith into this grace which we now stand. <clears throat> it's all present tense stuff. It's there already in place. It's current event. It's not a wish or a doubt, but a reality for Paul. Faith, does, uh, faith in Jesus becomes a key then that unlocks the door and gives access into the Father's house. And that grace, that hope that he talks about won't disappoint us because God has already poured out his love, his grace, it's already given us the Holy Spirit. We have these things. They're already present. It goes on. And we boast in the glory of God. Yep, who doesn't like to boast in the glory of God? <laughs> but then begins the hard part. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Uh, yeah, really? Not my favorite idea either. But Paul understands better than most that suffering is just a fact of life. But it can be productive. We remember 2 Corinthians 11, 24 and following, where Jesus lists some of the things that he had to endure. Whipped five times, beaten three times with rods, pelted with rocks, left for dead. Uh, three times he was shipwrecked, in constant danger from multiple angles, hungered, he thirsted. Paul understands sufferings. But he boasts in his sufferings because more than at any other time in his life, in those weaknesses, in those sufferings, he can see Jesus' strength working on his behalf, see it more clearly than ever uh, in those times. 
in the heavy times, when the heavy lifting uh, is going on, he sees that the heavy lifting is being done by Jesus the whole time. So <clears throat> the same idea is here in Romans 5. We rejoice in our sufferings because, because, that word signals that there's something coming. There's something worthwhile. It produces something. First, it produces uh, perseverance, hupomone. It's, uh, it's often a word translated patient endurance. I, however, like to translate it stretched. Stretched to one's limit like a rubber band, but doesn't snap or break because of God's grace. It holds on. So let's consider an illustration from Illustration Exchange. It's kind of a neat little story about Paul Richter, Carl Paul Richter, who was a Harvard and John Hopkins educated biologist, psychobiologist, and geneticist. He served for many years as director of, of John Hopkin, Hopkins uh, Psychiatric Clinic, where he served until becoming professor of psychobiology in 1957. Anyway, he's got a history in psychology. He made uh, many important contributions to the fields of biology and psycho, uh, physiobiology or psychobiology. Um, one of the most famous experiments he did was involved drowning rats, a study which today would probably land him in jail for animal cruelty. So goes the illustration. <clears throat> now he knew that rats had a reputation for being able to swim for exceedingly long periods of time, uh, over 50 hours. Yet when he placed the rats in tightly con uh, confined buckets of water, they quickly discovered they had no means of an outlet, no means of relief, and literally gave up, allowing themselves to sink into the water, drowning on average within 15 minutes. Now, he knew that they had the physical ability to continue swimming much longer. So he concluded they, that they must have felt helpless and hopeless. So he tried again, this time pulling the rats from the water once he saw, saw that they were beginning to struggle. He let them rest for a short time before returning them back to the bucket. Then once again, they would swim, testing the confines of their surroundings. But instead of giving up and allowing themselves to sink and drown, they kept swimming and swimming and swimming. Many swam up to 60 hours until their bodies could simply endure no more. So what's the difference here? The difference between the two groups of rats, what is it? Richter concluded the difference was hope. Now, we know the old saying, right? Just keep, your, just keep my head above water. That wasn't said by rats, but by people who struggle. And this also reminds me of the seven missionaries in 1993 who were headed back to Alaska from, from Russia. And on the way back, they, they ran out of fuel about 20 miles so, uh, uh, just outside of Alaska, Nome, Alaska, and crashed into the Bering Sea, into those frigid waters. And miraculously, they survived, swimming up to 90 minutes, one of them lasting that long. I say miraculously <clears throat> because swimming in these frigid waters normally you're not supposed to be able to last more than, than a few minutes and survive. But they waited together uh, uh, and they were shouting scripture at one another, and building one another up and praying. They just kept swimming until the rescue helicopter finally came and got them and all survived. Amazing. But they persevered. They were stretched to their absolute limit. But they persevered, they endured, however you want to translate it, by the grace of God. They didn't know they had it in them, but they discovered it. Now from being stretched, it goes on to the next thing, to the max. You, you get stretched to the max, you go on to character. Here's a word that is, means something is tested. Something that you discover its value, how great the value is within it. A lady I know once uh, found a, uh, had took her ring to a jeweler to have it appraised. Turned out this ring had been hanging in a box on an old uh, safety pin for some time. And when she took it in to be appraised, it turned out to be worth thousands. She had no idea. Character, in this case, is a word similar to something being appraised and then discovering its true value. Once we're stretched to our limit, we realize what Paul did, that the Lord has been there the whole time, that he has given us a great deal and is still there. And if I can endure so much and overcome so much, then I can develop a thing called hope. And I realize just how valuable that all is. <clears throat> so hope comes along. 
Hope is well placed. It changes us. Uh, it motivates us to keep swimming, to keep anticipating what Jesus has promised, no matter how bad things get. It also changes how we see ourselves. As we've talked a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> we don't just do work for ourselves. We do whatever we do for the glory of God, right? So it's not just about us. We see ourselves as part of God's family and as part of God's kingdom in doing so. Hope then changes what is important, what is important. It doesn't just change us, but what also is important to us. And when we know, uh, <clears throat> when we know we have a secure future, we tend to, to value the word a lot more highly and the things that Jesus teaches us a little more deeply. The word that speaks about loving our neighbor becomes important because, uh, um, because it's part of what Jesus teaches us. It becomes as important of being, as being raised with Christ. And in this, we also tend to value others more highly. Uh, in other words, we are more likely to invest in Jesus' stuff when we realize the hope that we have been given. We are more likely to use kind words, show kindness, and practice a faith that uh, is you know, expressed in very real ways with other people. Finally, hope is empowering. Hope reduces fear of the unknown. You know, because of our experiences, Jesus, Jesus will be bigger than our giants. Just as David recalled how the Lord helped him take down the bear and the lion. Remember we talked about that a few weeks back? David knew from experience that he was going to take that giant down because his hope was secure. His confidence was there to do so based on his previous experience. <clears throat> experience would empower you and I the same way. And so I pray that the Lord may empower you to be fearless and bold and enduring so that when you are stretched to your absolute limit, just trying to keep your head above water, you may turn to God's grace and that it might work within you a greater certainty and a greater faith when you need it most. Nothing of this world can take away what God promises any of us, and especially not Jesus. And since Jesus is with us, well, what does the scripture say? If God is for us, nothing can be against us. So we count on that, and that's where we place our confidence today. Now, I pray that the Lord would bless you in all this, and I pray that this thought today was a blessing to you. And I hope that this is a good week for you and that it is filled with hope in Jesus. Uh, in the meantime, the Lord bless you, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining me again. Bye-bye.